Yo. So continuing on, after the, the few dark scenes that kind of ended out the last video, we get a very uplifting scene where Ara and Pence meet up and they're hanging out outside. And Pence's company very much keeps Ara sane because whenever she's around Pence, something very distinct occurs. A lot of sensory evocations occur, a lot of sensory descriptions in the book. So instead of silence, dark, lack of communication, retreat into herself, it's much more outward. So for instance, Pence brings along apples. So they're eating apples. And then there's also just descriptions of the warmth of the sun, the breezes, fragrances, smells. So Pint is drawing her out of her reclusiveness. So Pint and I are talking about becoming priestesses. Pint is elaborating on her own story. And one point she touches on is that she became a priestess because her family had too many girls. So it doesn't take too much to presume that they wanted boys. And also she refers to the fact that they couldn't continue to keep marrying their girls off. So once again, we get this through these secondhand stories, what it's like to be a girl in this society, right? They don't have that much value. They don't have that much worth. And there's one point where Ara asks Pint, you know, would you rather not have become a priestess? To which Pint replies with an emphatic yes. And we get this line. I'd rather marry a pig herd and live in a ditch. I'd rather anything than stay buried alive here all my born days with a mess of women in a perishing old desert where nobody ever comes. So yeah, she clearly does not like the position that she's stuck in. And then also Pint opens up Ara to this idea of, it seems like unfaith. And you have to remember for Ara, this is a revelation for someone who's been bred to administer religious rites and maintain vigil over these forgotten tombs. Faith is everything to Ara. And it's interesting that Pint empath empathizes with Ara's position. She understands why Ara finds so much importance in religion, right? Because she's the one special custodian to the nameless ones. That's a, it gives her a unique identity. It gives her some sense of self. Pint feels like she has nothing to aspire to either. And once again, after most of the conversations with Pint, there's just a lot of outward sensory expressions, like this opening up to the world rather than this withdrawing away from it. There's another interesting dynamic that occurs between Ara and Pint. So even though Ara knows that Pint might not believe so much in the Nameless Ones, Ara still views Pint as being afraid of the dark. And once again, because this dark tomb is sort of, sort of her individual, it creates her identity because it gives her a place kind of to be herself where she's alone. She takes pride in the fact that Pint is afraid of it, right? And you have to remember, Pint is never, has no idea. She doesn't associate the dark with religion, but Ara does. Because in the dark is Ara's chance to be herself, right? She goes into the tombs and there's no one else up there. It's just her. She explores how she chooses to explore. She's retreating inward, right? Maybe meditating in the dark. She finds herself. And I think to, to Ara, religion is the dark maze, right? In the dark is religion, is when Ara gets to be herself. All these things are very connected to Ara. Pent and Castle being afraid of the dark, they're afraid of Ara. They're afraid of her religious expression. Ara, sometimes when she goes into the tombs, right before she goes, she is scared. The priestess of the tombs must be able to enter her domain without terror, to know its ways. And remember, she has to learn to accept this role. This is all she's got, even if it is terrifying. But also remember, sometimes terror in this story seems like a stand-in for boredom. And then I kind of wanted to stop here and do a slight discussion on the significance of the tomb. Do they represent anything else? Well, yeah, the, the tombs are actually a stand-in for Ara's mind. And as she explores the tombs, the exploration of her mind, what is the labyrinth? This maze that's set aside that no one else goes, only the one priestess can go to. It's dark, it's dank, it's confusing, and it's perilous. I think that represents something of the subconscious, repressed self, maybe your deepest beliefs, maybe the beliefs that you don't even know you have. Maybe you hold a wild belief about, I don't know, music, and then until you actually get it challenged, you're like, oh, I didn't even know I had that. Why am I defending this? You don't know. Some of the connections go a little deeper. There's a point where R as Star, one of the other priestesses, for directions in the labyrinth. 
they specifically mention that no one's ever drawn these out. So there's no map, just like in your mind, there's no spatial composition. It's just bundles of neurons. You don't know the directions between thought. You think this thought, that thought leads to this thought. And there's like thought connection. It's not spatially composed. How is it described? Well, it's just described kind of in terms of twists and turns, rights and lefts and touch. And also the depths of the labyrinth is this kind of thing that belongs only to her. That's why no one can enter. Only the one priestess can. I don't think she's explored that yet. She hasn't even been into the labyrinth. Just to connect some of these themes further, when she inherits this tradition, the, the catacombs beneath this place, and if you think of that as a stand-in for her mindset, you have to think of it as indoctrination. She didn't create the pathways in her brain. She didn't create these connections. No, she was indoctrinated. She learned these as she was growing up. She didn't get choice. And, and that's one of the limitations she's had the whole book. She doesn't have freedom for self-expression. As she's adopting this tradition, as she's feeling like she's one with this heritage, she's just adopted a mindset. She's adapted a maze of beliefs in her head. Right. So even as she's exploring it, she's not creating anything new. She's just coming to realizations about how this tradition works, about this maze of her brain. And another interesting thing is, as she's growing up in this book, wandering these pathways, it's not like she's creating a self. If, if society has imposed all these rules and laws and beliefs on you, that's what you're going to believe. And all you get to do is blindly wander the pathways allowed to you. The only way to really explore yourself is, in some sense, through memory. Like, who, who are we? That's how we make associations. That's how we have emotions. That's what we react to. When she's memorizing these pathways, she's just memorizing the tradition. But in some sense, the tradition who she is. So she's just memorizing what they've created for her to be. But if you think of this kind of too as a like self-exploration, it is kind of a form of meditation. What she's doing, I think, is kind of meditating on her position in life. And as she grows more conscious and more aware of it, yeah, maybe even though it is fraught with danger, she can one day begin to change it. This mindset that she's been indoctrinated with. A, a scene from the book to kind of sync up this pathways with thoughts, we get this. The powers of the dark, the nameless ones, would guide her steps here just as they would lead astray any other mortal who dared into the labyrinth of the tombs. She's leading you astray because she doesn't want you to know who she is. She doesn't want you to challenge her belief. Another line that's very interesting is this, when referring to her exploration of the labyrinth. She did not go far in that first time far enough that the strange, bitter, yet pleasurable certainty of her utter solitude and independence grew strong in her and led her back and back again and each time farther. So she's learning to enjoy it. She's learning to express her identity through retreating once again into herself and exploring the only possibility she has left. So when those men were put into the tombs as prisoners, they were dehumanized. So they're not in any way going to be impure. They were emaciated. They were near death when they were put in there. So there's no way for a priestess to think of them in any enticing way. Like there's no sexual connotation there. Because remember, prisoners inside the tombs equals prisoner kind of inside your mind, inside your thoughts. You can still be very pure and have a dehumanized person in front of you. And then the other point was this touch as guidance in the dark. If you're only using touch, you're using something other than your eyes. And that's very much synonymous with like exploring your own self. If you're meditating, you're not really using your eyes. What, what are you following? Your sense of yourself, your thoughts, your memories. So this constant emphasis on touch as guidance in the tombs and in the labyrinth really makes sense because you can't use your eyes. You have to rely on something else, something maybe a little more abstract to lead you. However, there might be another way to interpret all these last three things that I just mentioned, and that is through a sexual perspective. The men as defiled. If they're dehumanized, you can't think of them sexual. But if a man does get into your mind and they are just a man, it could lead to impure thoughts. This whole idea of self-exploration does kind of have connotations of self bodily exploration. And I think it's interesting to reread the quote I just read with that in mind. It seems to offer a completely different conclusion. So she did not go far into it that first time, but far enough that the strange, 
bitter yet pleasurable certainty of her utter solitude and independence there grew strong in her and led her back and back again and each time farther. Maybe. Castle being kind of afraid of the tombs, it is kind of a stand-in for Ara's distaste or maybe disdain even for Castle. Whenever she's in her mind, Ara wants her out. Castle can't stay there. Castle is very susceptible to the spirits because when Ara turns her will on her because she doesn't like her, Castle can't stay. So she can't stay in Ara's thoughts, just like she can't stay in the tombs. As the story continues, we realize that Ara is growing more comfortable exploring the tomb. Graves might be there, but she could not see them. She could not see anything. It was black, it was silent, and that was all. After she's executed these prisoners, there's a moment where she does kind of feel sorry. She feels regret. As she's growing more used to the labyrinth and the tombs, what that means is she's growing more used to this indoctrinated mindset. So if you think about this quote from that perspective, Graves might be there, but she could not see them. She's not using her own thoughts anymore. Who cares what she's done? She's not leading. She's letting tradition lead. And then it goes on to say she cannot see anything. It was black. It was silent. This isn't my concern. Someone else has told me to do this. I'll just do it. That's it. And then once again, as the story continues to develop, we get Thar, Kossel, and Ara all discussing this story of the Ring of Erethok, which is the ring that was in A Wizard of Earthsea. Just a reminder, Ged found that lost in his own conscience. And so when he finds this ring, he makes peace with these people who have been exiled from the Kargish lands. Now a truce can be made between these two continents. So the other half is going to have to come from somebody from Cargate. So they're telling these stories. Kossel, yes, yeah, very vile person. And she's adopted the easy arrogance, I would say, associated with the God King himself. She feels that authority. There is a point, I think, when they're separated, when Thar kind of tells one of the other priestesses, tells Ar, like, hey, the God King is pretty unflattering. Um, and, and as they're describing this, it is pretty cool because in their fear of wizards, they make wizards seem very badass in there because wizards are apparently are constantly trying to pilfer these tombs in order to find this treasure that's hidden there. And we also learn here that Ar is, in fact, a guardian of a great treasure she can't use. In some sense, she wants to be the owner of it, but what good does it matter if you have a great treasure that you guard that you can never use? It's interesting the way Castle justifies her hate and resentment for wizards by saying that they don't have an immortal soul. Ara actually pities them because of this. And then as Ara is once again retreating more into herself, she does begins later to accept her attendant or not. And she begins showing him kind of the basics of the labyrinth, and he's been faithful to her all her life, so this makes sense. And now she's finally kind of entrusting him with, I would say, like, knowledge of herself. Like, she's showing who she is. And then one of the best scenes, Ara is exploring the under tomb one day, and there's someone in there. Ara is stunned. And there's this person shining this light in there, illuminating the under tomb, this place that she's never seen. So she freaks out. The wizard hears her, and then he tries to hide in the labyrinth. She locks him in. And this is cool, but there's a point when he's shining the, this light, his mage light, and he's illuminating the tomb, and we get a very interesting line. Yet even as she prayed, right, she's, she's stunned. In her mind's eye, she saw the quivering radiance of the lighted cavern, life in the place of death. And instead of terror at the sacrilege and rage against the thief, she thought only how strange it was. How strange. The wizard is illuminating the undertomb. In some sense, this is part of herself, and it will be notable later that the wizard will turn out to be Ged, and he'll tell her, well, I used to have a small flame in you. What is this, this strangeness that she sees? She sees light in herself. She sees the old Tanar, and throughout the book, there are snippets of what she remembers from when she was young, certain smells, the way her mother looked. And this is the last remnants within her of what she, who she used to be, of Tanar, because she's almost been consumed. So it's very strange to her to see this. She's not feeling terror, not feeling sacrilege, not feeling rage against the thief. She's feeling what it was like to be Tanar. So that small flame, that small illumination of the cavern is the illumination of herself, her past self. And after she traps him, she actually pities him because now she, he's trapped in the labyrinth and she believes she has to kill him. That's the only way to go about this. She does pity him because she's worried that his soul will just float on until it's completely consumed. Because she can't just change. She can't just up and walk out of her mentality. She, even though she sort of empathizes with him for illuminating her, she can't just change her mindset. In her mind, he has to fight. 
after she traps him, she kind of starts playing a game with it. So there are points all throughout scattered around the tombs of the place where there are peepholes, and only the priestesses know that, but you can see into the labyrinth. She begins to tell him to go to different rooms, and she'll at different times talk to him in these different rooms, because it's part of her is intrigued. At first she feels pity for him as he's trapped, and he's growing weaker, he's withering. And then there's a moment when she gets mad after it. She was just like, I'm just gonna keep him alive indefinitely, teach him a lesson, I don't ever want him to escape. The pity is Tenar. The anger, the rage is Ara. And Ara also begins to fear him and his power because the fact that he's alive in the maze can be thought of as a will against will. The reason he didn't get attacked at first when she saw him was because she was too afraid to send her will against him. But now she has and he's still not dead. He's in her mind and she wants to kill him but he's not dead to her yet. She's still thinking about him so her will can't completely crush him. As he's becoming weaker and weaker, she goes in there and gives him some food with her attendant Benai, and she sees him shiver, and she throws a coat on him to warm it, and Benai immediately tells her, you have to burn that coat. It's been defiled. And we learn that male slaves are just absolutely no consequences. This is a tradition for women to be consumed by. There's a lot of scenes where she's waving. We see her consider sending him to the treasure room just so he'll go there, so he'll see the treasure, and then realize what he'll never get, and then die. This is the exact same case for her, right? She can't use this treasure, she's just guarding it for no reason. What good is it to have all these beliefs in yourself if you can't use it, if you just have to crush them? That great treasure is to not. Can she ever acquire it? Can she ever escape with it?